Well, a lot of this work is, is up and coming. I, I think that it's hard to say uh, in, in generality how people behave to what. I think uh, uh, in the economics literature, there's been a lot of questions and a lot of interest in how to design incentives for people and what makes an incentive mechanism a good mechanism. There's a characterization of what makes th make things uh, good for people. And, uh, you know, I mean, intuitively you think about them as things where the mechanism is fair, the mechanism is such that you, you don't have ways in which you can beat it, you don't try to play against it because you're incentivized to do the right thing as opposed to play games. And, and so there are principles for designing these kinds of mechanisms where then people respond in a good way. Uh, this is, even though when you think about a mechanism, it's, it's from, for a control theorist, it looks like a control strategy. However, controlling a, a, a system that we build is a lot different and a lot easier because the system does not try to play a game with my mechanism. It will respond exactly the way I would tell it to respond, or roughly the way I would tell it to respond. But with people, you can't make people do things. You can only provide them with incentives to do certain things. So, and you know that, right? You see, for example, when people get information about uh, roads uh, from uh, Google Maps, some people will say, oh, now, wait a minute, you know, this gives me a prediction up to five minutes. And I think that everybody now is going to be going that way, and maybe I will just go the other way. And I beat that system, and then everyone will be congesting this road, and I'll be going to another road that is not very congested. So right away, you're taking this information and you're strategizing against it in a, in a way that helps you. Um, so the mechanism of providing information may not be the perfect mechanism. So a lot of what we think about is how do we design mechanisms that prevent people from trying to play it? That's one aspect of it, right? Um, but the context is really important and I think there's been a lot of conversations about what are the right ways of incentivizing people. Um, it's often the case that we think, okay, let's, uh, let's do things like congestion pricing. Congestion pricing is, a, is an excellent idea in principle. Uh, so what we would have is dynamic tolls uh, for roads and when the road is congested, we increase the price. And now that you increase the price for going through that road, you start thinking twice. Maybe I shouldn't go. I'm paying $5 to go through the street. I'll go through the other street and maybe won't pay any money. So you incentivize people to move around based on money. And that makes sense. But it has also social implications that are non-trivial. If you actually look at, I mean, when I look at my bill, um, um, how much money I pay, how much toll I pay every month uh, just taking uh, Route 90, uh, the highway, um, um, I pay something like $60 a month. And for some people, $60 a month is a lot of money. And so the incentive mechanism created, although it's not dynamic, it's static, everybody pays the same amount of money every time they cross, that mechanism differentiates uh, 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 on the basis of salary, on the basis of how much money you have. So some people who may not be able to afford paying $60 a month would take the different routes. And that makes it an unfair mechanism. Even though it looks like, oh, you know, you want to use it, why don't you pay the money? But in fact, it does differentiate a different class, a different uh, income class. And that's an issue that we have to be thinking about. I mean, we're, in terms of uh, what other ways you can think about in terms of incentive mechanisms, you have to remember that uh, money is one way, information is another way, and social pressures is a third way. Um, if you think about uh, recycling, um, it's very interesting how the percentage of people that recycle has been increasing very rapidly, and we don't pay them for it. Nobody gets paid for recycling, and it's not against the law not to recycle. But the, the reason we all do it, and we are very uh, systematic about it, is that we believe that we're doing something good for for the well-being of everyone. We are contributing to society through recycling. And that message came across loud and clear, and we followed. If you offer to pay me $5 at the end of the month for recycling, I may change my mind. Because if the state offers me $5 for recycling, then the state has priced the value of my recycling to $5.
If it's only five dollars, if the value is only five dollars, it may not be that important to me, you know. And so, and so here is a mechanism which was entirely based on information and potentially social pressure, but potentially also um, uh, positive, uh, uh, wanting to be uh, a positive impact on the, on the environment. That Trump, uh, you know, that has had a much better effect than offering some reward at the end of the month for, for doing it. So we're trying to understand how people respond to these kinds of messages and there's been work on experimenting with people and trying to understand what sort of incentives are more effective in getting, getting them to do or getting everybody to do the right thing. Um, places like Europe, for example, everybody shuts the lights when they leave the room. They never leave lights on. In the United States, everybody leaves and the lights are on. You know, It's just a cultural issue. Maybe electricity was very cheap and we didn't care. But maybe it didn't matter what the price is, we just, we leave it on and then it's okay to leave it on. Um, and so you look at how much electricity buildings consume, it's, it's outrageous in terms of electricity, heating and cooling and so forth. And a lot of that could be, well, one aspect automated. We could use uh, lights that shut off when there's no motion in the room. We can also regulate temperature in a, so we could do physical control actual control mechanisms to reduce um, the consumption and increase the efficiency but also we can change some of the habits and educate people that when you leave the room you shut the light you know or you don't have to have the temperature at 60 degrees in the in the middle of the summer it could be 65 or 68 you know these are examples of projects that we're working on our work is uh, tends to be um, a methodical in the sense that we are developing tools and methods for people to exploit to design these kinds of examples. We have also some data collection and, uh, and, and experimental results that we verify some of the thinking that we have. But um, much of the work is really foundational about how do you think about this problem, how do you design these mechanisms, how do you co-design a mechanism with a control strategy uh, at the same time, something on the physical part and something on the social part that are designed at the same time. How do you do it? How do you actually come up with these designs? That's what we spend a lot of time on.